characters that started with Dr. Faustus and this idea of the Faustian uh, Bargian, B- Bargian, the Faustian, the Faustian Bargian. Bargian, the Faustian Bargian. <laughs> It's like backstage, but there's no stage. It's the standby for places green room. Welcome to In the Green Room. Welcome back to another episode of In the Green Room. My name is Ben Mandel, and my this is my co-host Margie Zarcone. And today we are joined by Marissa Flores, who is currently starring as Dr. Faustus in Standby for Places: uh, The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe which you can all listen to on Apple Music and Spotify. And but Google Podcasts to... as well. And Google Podcasts as well. We are everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Marissa. Yeah, my pleasure, you guys. So Margie and I were, we were talking leading up to this. You know, we had both, we had both read this in, in school and now we're revisiting it. Um, and it's, it's really amazing how uh, how pervasive this story has become. Um, its archetype, its character, its theme, the the whole idea of the Faustian bargain. Um, I, you know, I was hoping that we could hear from you just maybe a little bit about yourself, your background as an actor, and then how you approach this part. And what about, you know, what about maybe your identity or your background informed your perspective, your cho- the choices you made, all about that in an audio format. Um, yeah, give us a spiel. Sure. So I started acting at a young age, I feel like a lot of people, a lot of people do. Uh, I was like about eight years old and started just doing the school plays and things like that. And then I took it more serious in high school. I had really good drama teachers. I did choir. I was always a show girl, basically. <laughs> and then, um, of course, I, I, I always thought it was interesting because I've always, you know, I'm actually a scientist. So like I've done, oh, wow. uh, yeah, so I'm getting my my master's in epidemiology and clinical research is my my field. So it's funny because I always end up coming back to the arts and the yeah. and theater and all those wonderful things. And um, I, that's just a love that I've always had. So while I haven't done it like professionally, professionally, like some of my castmates are favorite majors or, uh, you know, and I have the most respect for them. And I'm just like, I'm just a lowly science major trying to still get my <laughs> kicks doing theater. So wow. that what really- an interesting intersection though with yeah, Dr. Faustus so- and yeah, science background. Being a doctor, or you know, and I really like that it was a female character. Uh, Megan is very forward thinking, I think, as a director, and so her being like, "No, I want this to be a woman." Um, yeah. She approached me uh, because I have done a few Zoom plays with her already. Actually, just one. I don't know why I said a few. <laughs> but, uh, I did one with her, and uh, after that, we just I. She asked me to be in this production. I said, absolutely. I left Shakespeare and Marlowe and all those people behind in English in high school. And they came yeah. back and I was like, wow, I don't know what I'm even saying in some of these scenes. So yeah. it was really, it was really funny. But uh, Megan was really knowledgeable. And, and Tim, also one of my, my castmates, he majored in this. He made, he's majoring in Shakespeare. So it was so awesome to have their perspective it really helped me build my character and understand what I'm saying and really wow. deliver a proper, a proper, you know, show for everybody, uh, which was my main, main goal, you know, doing all the theater. Uh, I did Othello. I was like witch number two in, in Macbeth. So like I've done a few things like that, but like again in high school. And, and like I said, I, I left that stuff behind. So it was nice to revisit it, get the opportunity to, to play. And then it was like a little intimidating because she was like, I'm going to give you the lead role. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Were you familiar? Were you familiar with the piece before you started? Oh, no, no, uh, not at all. And so, uh, well, I mean, I shouldn't say not at all because I've heard of it. I've just never sat down and read it, dissected it, anything like that. I would have been mm-hmm. a little more comfortable doing like, like I said, like a Shakespeare play because that's something that I've worked on before. Uh, but right. then I found out that they were friends, so I was like, it shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's wild to think about these writers as like contemporaries, like palling around doing whatever it is they did um, yes, during their time periods. Kind of cool though that you weren't super like textually familiar with it at first because it, I, I bet it was easier to make your own decisions about the character, especially since there was a gender switch. You didn't have any like preconceived notions. No, Sometimes I that can that be so really hard. Different. I was, I told me I was like, I'm your blank slate 
honestly like but yeah, the door is open for you just to jump in That's tell me yeah tell me what you and i'm you know i always think it's a really good uh mix when an, when an actor can bring their own taste their own things like that but can also take direction it's really important um and so i like to stay in that realm of like, just you know tell me what you'd like and i i know how to add a flair but you can tell me when you're like no i want you to take this a little bit more seriously faustus character is so like in some of the scenes where he's like messing around with the pope with mephistopheles versus him just being like i'm going to hell like he has such a variety or she, i don't even know like she he has such a variety of feelings in this play and it's like well how do i deliver that half with not really knowing being familiar with the character and the other half not being familiar with this language making sure that i'm staying on beat with the <laughs> it's, it's something and it's i think it's very interesting and in, in particular with faustus because it's about this guy who's pursuing magic and magic involves all these incantations and chants yes. and at least for me when i'm like margie and i are, are also both actors for me when i'm working on so you were gonna say both witches we're both we're both witches yeah. <laughs> we both dabble in the dark arts <laughs> i know for me um, when i'm like rehearsing a chant yeah <laughs> when I'm in the middle of a seance. Um, yeah. no, like, Please when enjoy when my Latin in those conjuring scenes because I sat, I was, I was a, I'm a good Catholic, right? I saw this and I was like, well, this Latin seems pretty doable. Also I took like Latin for medical terminology. So I was like, I know yeah. some words and Megan's like, just watch the pronunciation. So in my room, I'm practicing and I'm like, I feel like, <laughs> like the conjuring the devil scene was scary to practice by myself. Yeah. And my, I'm oh. like, ooh. Gonna sleep well, what, a, what a great overlap and like something for you to approach this kind of work with and like when i'm working on classical text sometimes the text itself feels like an incantation because of the rhythm <laughs> and the structure of it right absolutely yeah wow that's fascinating that uh, that what a great what a great point enjoy those those were <laughs> those were like the most interesting parts i think for me was sit there and learn the latin that was actually the first scene megan had me rehearse was him like conjuring and i was like she was like wow that was read with so much uh she was like feeling and it was good and i was like i just <laughs> was like i'm just gonna sound like a crazy person trying to conjure the devil which is basically what faustus is <laughs> I was like, crazy dude i, I saw a, a few years ago i saw a play called Tamburlaine the Great, which is by Marlowe. It was at a theater in Brooklyn called Theater for a New Audience. And the star of it was this amazing actor named John Douglas Thompson, who I think is considered one of the better interpreters of classic texts doing it on stage right now. And I like caught him after the show and had a chance to speak with him for a few minutes. And he was telling me that working on Marlowe, he said it felt like, like throwing a snowball down a hill. Mm -hmm. And then it like, and you're the snowball and you kind of just have to like, jump on the wave and let it go and let it grow and get bigger and bigger as you keep going down like do you think is that something you can identify with like do you yeah, think that absolutely. do you did you have that feeling at all so i don't know if i i definitely felt like i had to roll with it because the way yeah. that 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 marlo and i really find him a little bit more interesting than shakespeare for that, oh, for that hot take alert hot take oh, hot take, <laughs> hot I'm take. Not this now but <laughs> Um, I actually, because just the way that he lines up some of the scenes are just like, and they're so, obviously there's so much to read into, right? Oh, so can we talk about the orgy scenes that Marlo puts into this play? Or the fact that like, I'm literally going to have sex with the demon version of Helen from Troy? <laughs> like, or like the deadly sins, like the way that Megan would have casted it, they would be like, basically like pawing at, like lust would be like pawing at me, trying to like get me. And so I was like, wow what imagery and this literally happens after a scene where i'm literally begging mephistopheles to like let me let me or we're gonna go mess with the pope <laughs> like, so yeah. it's, it's just gonna go and box his ears i think is what he does and then right? his, his does. like time changed through the play i felt bad for megan because i was like you're gonna have to direct that i'm just here like what how many time jumps is this now like that we've done <laughs> uh where i'm like uh, reminiscing on all the fun that I've had in the last, I guess, 24 years <laughs> with just all over through Rome, visiting everything. I was like, wow, Marlo's like everywhere, but it's so, it has a point. But, you know, of course you see the point later, um, but I really, I definitely can feel like you just have to roll with what he's doing, which makes it interesting. I really, I, re I wasn't bored. 
that makes sense. There's some parts in Shakes are not like, this is dragging on, like in Hamlet. Back to what you said about uh, Marlo, uh, you, your hot take of Marlo being more interesting than Shakespeare, which I kind of agree with. Um, I think- He was the edgy one. He was the edgy one. I make fun of all the religions in this play. <laughs> yes, I really? I read that there's this whole like Marlo myth around him too, that is almost similar to the mystique of Dr. Faustus in this like clouded and mystery, dark broodingness. Like that there were all these accusations that Marlo was engaging in witchcraft and all this stuff. And yeah. I, I always wonder like how much of that, you know, what, what came first? Was the mystique about Marlowe first and then he wrote Dr. Faustus or was it that he wrote Dr. Faustus and then people were like, he's a witch or. I have to believe that if you write a play like this, that you have to find some of your fault. Like maybe he was trying to get out that side in, in this character. Cause I have to believe it. you're going to write a character like Dr. Faustus that has to have some inspiration from somewhere. Like, it couldn't have just been his friend, like, because there's so much personal, um, I do feel like there's personal things that are in Faustus that definitely, well, I wouldn't know, but Marlo's character, I can, I can probably guess, he's probably putting a little bit of his own, I mean, maybe he, he did think about it. I mean, the idea, right, of being an all-powerful person is something that humans want, our weakness is that, you know, and everyone that sits there is like, no, I don't, I don't want full power, I don't want this, like, yes, you do. You want to be able to walk into a room and wow people. You want to be able to, which, I mean, you want to do more than magic, which is basically all Faustus does. But it's like he, you, everyone has that. So that's a relatable feeling. And so yeah. that's an easy thing for, I guess, any, anybody to be like, well, Marlo, or well, Marlo probably felt that way. And so did Faustus. Marlo probably felt that way because his friend was Shakespeare. <laughs> I'm just like, so, so there's, there might be just something like that. And he was different and portray which relates to what you were just saying marissa about how like this desire for power and then when you tie that into like how the character of dr faust this you you see like the shadow of this character in so many other literary figures tv show characters movie characters things like this and the one one that you brought up marge to again bridge the gap between marlo and shakespeare was prospero and it's like um you know, he's a, he is a wizard, right? Or he was the Duke of Milan, but now he's kind of like this all knowing, all powerful kind of like overseer of this island. And there's, I, I've, I've certainly read about how Prospero, like the, um, the Tempest was Shakespeare's last play. And that like Prospero is very much kind of, you could see it as Shakespeare himself. And like, the, and, it, and it's sort of high-minded, the artists seeing themselves as like a conjurer um, in what they create. And I mean, like, I think, you know, a lot of us who, who, who perform in the arts, who write, who create in our, in our moments of inspiration, that's what it feels like. Mm. It's not to be cheesy or corny about it, but like, I think there's many analogies to be made. And so I think that your point about Marlowe putting himself in Faustus is so legitimate. And I think it's spot on. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I remember that book, The Tempest, being a lot about like, reflecting british colonialism right going into that. yeah oh yeah but, totally oh yeah no it's i'm I, you know i actually should know because tim and, and megan explained it but i i'm i know that the time that marlo was writing this play was during like um the schism of like christianity right so you have mm -hmm. like martin luther and all those kinds so i think the play reflects that a lot like in that area too well it's inter when ben and i were researching for this interview so uh -huh. uh, this is the first, the, the character of Faust was based on a real person in Germany. And that character of Faust was very much a product of the Reformation in wow. Germany. Okay. And it was very much written as a didactic, like, you should be afraid of this, like, moral warning tale. Right. Like and Juliet was like, this is what happens when you marry for love. <laughs> it, it, it was very much a like a preachy, like something they tell you in Catholic school, like see what happens if you do this. And, and then Marlo <laughs> picked up on it, but he took all that moral morality out of it and was like, oh, this is just a really interesting character. And that's when it became a dramatic interpretation and not just a like, not like going to schools and like the drunk driving 
talk of like two students on stage. <laughs> like that's essentially kind of what it was. And then he took that out of it and made it a like, oh, what if we fully fleshed out this person? And, but we went down a whole rabbit hole of these characters uh, that we know and love, uh, a lot of which are scientists. Dr. Frankenstein really, yeah. and- I, I love, I loved that part about the character. Actually, oh, most of my characters that I portrayed. Also, I swear, when you read my bio, when you see the picture that I've chosen, you'll be like, oh, no wonder she gets casted for these evil bitchy roles. <laughs> I literally have like an eyebrow arch in my photo. I'm like, oh, this is why I, I only play these characters. Oh, we love a good sassy eyebrow. And I'm like, wow, I, I don't know, seriously, like, but every time there is, like, I feel like, I feel like most of the time when we are talking, this is my total own observation, there is absolutely no truth to this, but I feel like a lot of the time characters are put with, they're extremely smart and science-based, and that makes them evil, because they are fighting with the morality part of religion and philosophy and all those things, as if those two couldn't coexist together, and I, what a thought. I actually really find that inspirational. Some people are bothered by that, and I probably should be one of them, but for me, I'm like, of course, there's always been this schism. And so that moral fight within e in everybody is like, well, the science and all those things, what is evil versus good? And then you put those in those categories, and almost every character that I have played that's been an evil character has a science aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Like, even, even the, the science in Frankenstein. Because they're yeah. smart and they're interested in the body, that's so... That's such a great point. Yeah, yeah, it's and Frankenstein. I think we talked about Frankenstein, Margie. Like it's it's like the industrial, slightly more modern version of Doctor Faustus. I mean, he's literally trying to. And Faustus talks about uh, uh, like reawaking the dead, right? And that's what Frankenstein is all about. Um, and it flies yeah, in the face like of like, Faustus' main deal. He's like, I've cured the plague, but can I raise a man to? You know, I can't do it, so I ain't shit, basically. <laughs> it's also i think there's something to say about this ambition of well i've already accomplished this and i've already accomplished this and and there's not my i'm so smart there's nothing left for me to do exactly exactly which uh that's like idle minds right are the mm -hmm. dumb or idle hands are the dumb i think idle minds too is when you're sitting there and like you don't have anything to do of course you're gonna be like oh yeah i want to i want to summon the devil i'm bored <laughs> anything else all do. about temptation it's just like the and he i love the opening scene um where yeah. he's like i'm flipping through all of my books to find something worth my time and i can't and the only and i can't and not the bible the bible's basic basically is like these teachings are basic uh i'm bored with the law i'm bored with philosophy like what can, else can there be what's next but, but who, among us, who among us hasn't thought that you're just like I, i'm getting nothing i mean look yeah i've like you know i've read you know these books and it's like i've sometimes i look it up i look up here and i'm like there's nothing for me here i've i've read it all i've seen it all what else like this like knowing that something else is out there that you haven't read that you that you don't know about that's like the the yeah. allure of the unknown yeah it's so real in this play but for some people that's not the case right and so, so for some people and and what's funny is there's actually that um that there is that in the play as well where he's like going forth and because he doesn't know mm. about this stuff is why he's willing to go take it this far because he doesn't believe in hell he, he literally will sit there and mocks Mephistopheles like mm, where are you from again how is it that you're here who's your master <laughs> like who do, you, do you, who do you know here who do you know here yeah what are you why are you appearing to me like this let's go back and change it like that is so I just was reading that in the script and I was like, that is so pretentious. Like this character is, doesn't get it. Like he, the, uh, the demon appears in front of him and says, just the thought, oh, this is another scary thing. Just the thought of you wanting to conjuring the devil brought me here. And I was like, so think about all the bad thoughts that we have during the day. And now I keep picturing Mephistopheles next to me. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like just thinking about just the idea like that's how Marla wrote it just to freak us out like you didn't conjure not with your Latin or anything the thought of you wanting me here brought me here and yeah. I was like that's and witchcraft is the ultimate threat <laughs> to god-fearing people oh yeah that yeah. is the ultimate evil and, and anyone smart 
<laughs> right? Anybody would just leave it alone, right? But because he doesn't know what he, and, and that's why he moves forward with it. And like, for me, I think that's why we do, I, that's why I do some stuff because I'm like, well, I actually really don't know. I, I said yes to a play because I don't actually know how hard it could possibly be. There you go. <laughs> and now I'm like, well, that's good. But so chasing after things that are, we w as we want to grow and be ambitious. And then there's a dark and a light side to that. Yeah. And it Definitely. permeates through so many stories of Everybody. this person is smarter than everyone else. Therefore, they are a witch. But Dr. Faustus is actually engaging in witchcraft. <laughs> right. Well, it's like the angel and devil on the shoulders. Like that is everywhere. It's in like Looney Tunes even, you know, it's made it to yeah. that. And it's something that I certainly, you know, we can all identify with like the little voice telling you to, to do the right thing and, the other, and, and then the other voice telling you to like um, basically say, fuck it and do whatever you want. And it's like, you know, it's, of course, it's a, it's a very kind of bipolar way of looking at it because it's like these extremes, like you said, like good and evil, black and white up and down there's no in between um especially with faustus it's like either he's going to be this all-powerful like you know master of everything or he's going to rot in eternal inferno <laughs> like there yeah. is no in between so i mean it's because those are human experiences and i'm not sure if you guys can relate on this level with me at least for me when i have achieved something right or i'm working towards something and then i have it and I don't do what I'm supposed to do with it. And that's literally was a very relatable part for me with Faustus as well, because he had it. He had all the power he wanted and he didn't do anything with it. He messed around for 24 years and did yeah. what he yeah. just, you know, like he, and, and so that's, an, that is the literal, that's like the main theme that I was focusing on because for Marlo to write that in there, right? I know everyone's like, oh, he's an idiot for doing that. I'm like, I don't know if I can call Faustus an idiot. I think he's just like a very un, like at the end of the day, when you have all the power, what are you going to do? Like, I'm going to mess with people and I'm going to like, I can bring people back from the dead. I can bring back their spirits. I can, you know, it's like he became an unmotivated individual in that moment. And he doesn't do anything with his power because at the very base of him, was not to be like this it was selfish reasons to move forward and i think yep. for a lot of people as well the selfishness of us wanting to get what we want i want to win the lottery i want to do those things and then us actually not doing anything with them when we have it is a human vice and marlo wrote it so well in this play she's also i'm like i think he's a little bit better than shakespeare because every a... human experience is in this play almost if you look for it and it's in this one character. And I think that's very profound. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I yes. mean, to the, yeah, the squandering of the opportunity. That's it's the most it's the most human thing imaginable. Yeah. Spending so much time chasing after something, and then when you finally get it, well, I don't know. What well, I don't know what to do with my hands. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, he's sitting there like I'll be here for twenty four, you know, twenty four years. Of this light of this luxury and he literally says it as like, I'm gonna live this way yeah and then it's like when it was over of course he's like I didn't I didn't mean I didn't do anything that I wanted to do and all he has to do is repent right all he has to do is say I'm sorry and that in itself if you ever wondered why pride was a deadly sin that is why because he's it's more than it's more than just being like I don't it, it's it's actually believing that you don't deserve happiness is actually prideful and i don't think people realize wow. that. So a lesson to be learned in that is when you're sitting around that's why sadness and all of these, is a vice all of the human vices are in this poor character <laughs> so, so yeah. like, at the end of the day i just feel sorry for this character because literally every bad human moment that we all experience he his whole foundation of of his character is based on all of them how was he supposed to succeed after that? So it's like, of course he was Honestly. a perfect conduit for the devil to be like, yes, this soul is too easy. Just put it behind me. Like, it's like he's only got one way to go when he's got all that power and it's down. Down, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I really loved Lucifer's lines in the, in the script as well. And especially because they're so, they're, they're dark and short as if 
I don't care about anything that you have to say. You mean so little to me because your soul is so easy to get. I don't have to sit here and you're going to watch all the deadly sins in front of me and you're going to say yes because I'm literally Lucifer. You're not going to tell me no. And I'm going to watch you fail. And it's going to be fun. It's kind of amazing (laughs) when you think about that because like Faustus is one man, one person, one woman, one character. And these demons appear at a moment's notice. So you think about it for a sec, if you zoom out, there are all these scientists around who are probably having these thoughts. Everyone who reads this play has these thoughts. Everyone who does this play has these thoughts. So it's like, it's all of a sudden, for like you just said about Lucifer, it's like, look how weak you are. You're nothing, you're a bug to me. And it's yeah. like, how many, how many Dr. Faustuses are there? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? This one play written about this one person. So we're inclined to think it's like central and he's a protagonist and he like represents this he is this one, he's all, like, maybe we think about him as an exception, but in fact, it's the most common thing ever. And there's probably yeah. hundreds of thousands of scientists just like this, yeah. be, you know, maybe in this time period who are pursuing this kind of thing. And so Lucifer is like, you're a dime a dozen. You're just like everybody else who would be tempted by something. I like know. That. And, and for, for that, I mean, you really had to look into it. Of course, I'm like, I, for me, like him being like delivering his lines or the, just the, the lines of Dr. Faustus, I was like, wow. Yeah. And his responses. And so when, when the lines are shorter in the play, that's Marlo saying something. Like, I'm um, like, when, when Luther, so that's what struck me. I was like, this play is literally about selling the soul to the devil. The devil's lines are this short for that reason, because wow. Faustus is not an important being to the devil. More importantly, I think Mephistopheles starts to like, have a have a relationship with Faustus that's like is it friendship is it pity is it, is it that you're just gonna be like me and I don't know what to tell you like it's a co-worker relationship like I really don't don't I'm um, fascinated by that dynamic I'm fascinated by that dynamic. yes especially because like you said like in the bible like demons and devilry and things like this it's very clear that they're that they're evil but yet in yeah. this play Mephistopheles is actually a pretty complex character because it's like he keeps warning Faust. It's like, you can get out of this if you want. He's like, I, I'm giving you an out. Like, this is the key. I'm telling you what it is. Here's the lock. All you have to do is put it in and you're, you're out of this deal. Like, and yet he won't take it. So it's like Mephistopheles becomes this like kind of nuanced, multidimensional yeah. character. It's kind of amazing. And that's what I love because we can't sit, we cannot give a definitive answer, right? I can't sit right. here and say, yeah, oh, they're best friends. Because, because at the very last breath that Faustus takes on this earth is him crying out to that guy and I wonder why (laughs) like I really do because because that would be like me well I mean not really because I would I would cry to my mom every time even if I knew I was wrong and she was right but like for for him to cry out to a character throughout the entire lifespan has been his like you know not slave but just person that like that's the reason that he's able to do anything Right. And then call out to him at the end. I'm like, why did you do that? I still don't know why he did that. <laughs> like, I don't know why, why any of that. And the relationship that, that a demon has with a human being in this play goes against everything about Christianity. Demons aren't even supposed to be able to feel anything outside of their, their realm of like, well, I'm just here for your soul. Right. It's weird that Mephistopheles sits in and is like, I'm going to give you a good time while you're here. <laughs> So yeah. Half the time. And then the other time when, um, when like I'm thinking about repenting, you know, in the scenes where, where I feel like I even in most of my monologues, I whisper because I don't want them to hear. Mephistopheles comes wow. in and he's like, you are backing out of our deal. So it's weird for him to be like, oh yes, don't, don't say, don't do it. And then at the same time be like, why are you asking about God? Like you can't. So it's, it's a weird dynamic. And Mephistopheles. Yeah character with mine is just really really interesting I don't and you bring up a really you bring up a great point about just in terms of like acting technique about how you're doing this in an audio format and like how much what it says to whisper something um versus saying it out loud just volume modulation changes so much about your intention and what you're saying why you're saying it who you're saying it to do you think it should be heard by everybody are you trying to be secretive about it are you can it's it's active you're concealing something um and it, it kind of brings the question of like, who is listening? Can someone hear me when you're, and it's like the thing about prayer, who's listening when you pray, 
versus right. when maybe when you're just confiding in yourself or just like, you know, I, we all talk to ourselves a little bit or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but like, that's definitely a thing too. And then is someone else listening when you're talking to yourself and like this day and age, we all have our, you know, we think our phones are listening to us at all times yeah. and like, you know, <laughs> so are we, I just see an illusion. Like, is there any Things. Yeah, it's like Mephistopheles or like the Instagram ads that just like pop up when you like mention something in conversation to your friend. It's like, how did that get there? Yes, exactly. So that those were interesting, like char- like choices that I made. Well, also like when I, when Mephistopheles is invisible to everybody except right. Faustus. So in those scenes where I'm like Mephistopheles, like I'm always like trying to audibly give you like a I'm me- talking to somebody who is not my main. Yes. And I mean, like, and that was kind of difficult, but those, dy- I felt like those dynamics needed to be there because it, it would be confusing otherwise. Well, I, I mean, confusing otherwise, and then also because I want to portray that my relationship with Mephistopheles is, is up here in my right, head right, versus right. what everyone else can see. And so I'm like, what an interesting thing to make that character invisible. And mm-hmm. I mean, they're an entity right no one else can see my suffering and my my <laughs> issues and I'm I'm just a great magician I'm just a great person I'm a doctor I do all these things my problems are right next to me mm-hmm. and they're self-inflicted most of our stuff is and we it's just like what a great way to just portray like I don't you could go so far and just be like this is literally like what what people suffer from all the time yeah. you know, mental illness what not even mental just daily day suffering that we have we carry it next to us it's invisible i speak to it when i give you know my negativity the the benefit of the doubt most of the time you know it's like okay so that was another way to kind of think about mephistopheles as my my vice too when i was wow. speaking to him yeah it was like and Ren, the, the, the person that plays Mephistopheles, she delivers that so well. It's so hard to not have a person to vibe with, with energy-wise when you're reading. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So, like, the fact that she could deliver that and I could, you know, we could go back and forth. And I told Megan some days, like, I would just, we would be doing the audio, we would be rehearsing. And I was like, I feel like I'm overacting because I have to get these, these things across. And she's like, no, not really. Isn't that amazing? Acting. Isn't that amazing <laughs> yeah. how when you when you're yeah. just into a microphone, you feel like you're being so big, and then you listen to it, and you're like, "Oh my god, it sounds yeah. normal." I was like, laughing. I really made like, a Snapchat video to show my friends because they were like, "How do you do?" I'm like, "It's not. It's not. I'm not like in my bed chilling reading these lines. Like I'm sitting there throwing my yeah my around and like you know made my facial ex- expressions. Like everything's still there. It's just." in my voice. Did you find that it changed how you listened to the other person? Oh. Yes. Now that I think about it, because, because listening, well, okay. So when you're acting on the stage, you're waiting for a delivery, right? And then I react to your delivery, vice versa for the whole play. So when, when we were acting and I was listening to like, uh, I guess the scenes mainly with, um, it was, it was, of course, with Mephistopheles, but then, um, who was it? The bishop, where, where mm-hmm. he's, like, asking me to bring back um, uh, Alexander the Great and his lover. Uh, yeah. And, and that was, that was a scene that I can guess, that's, like, the first thing that popped in my head when you say that, because listening to him, I had to be, like, because he's sitting there saying, well, I've heard you're the best person around here. And my response to him, because I noticed his voice didn't sound uh, calm, like it was like, no, I, I hear you're the best, so what do you got here? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. how he delivered that line is, is how I responded with my, oh, I mean, I, that's just what people say. You're going to have to see for yourself. When, when most of the time my responses with Faustus have, have always been sarcasm. Or there's always something about, because he's not a genuine person to the rest of the world, right? So his right. responses are always, in my head, they are. I don't know. If, I mean, when I read them and I portray them, I feel like I definitely am condescending in half of the time. And that was the first time when I was like, this isn't the time for that. And, and just because of the way those lines were delivered, they could have been delivered anyway. And the way they were delivered that way, I was like, ah, oh, yes. So this is the first time I'm going to take my character and down and, you know, have him, you know, be down a little bit 
mm-hmm. because you're talking to a bishop and you're trying to make yourself I think that he's talking to the bishop in this scene I might be wrong um, but either way like you're talking to someone who's uh, has authority and this is the first time I've seen Faustus has all the authority in the whole world right but mm-hmm. he's gonna play it down because I'm gonna show you with just also there's a knight that's like being an asshole and picking on him, being like, yeah, we'll see what you can do yeah. or something, right? And that's my favorite part. The last, I want you to know that I recorded that way I delivered that line, like on my app in my mm-hmm. phone where, where he's like, and you, you will you know, do right next time to scholars. And it was like, that's him literally being like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> or I'm going to put horns on your head again. so like that that was funny the bishop's lines too and delivering though he was like can you just change him back because he's gonna give me a hard time later on basically (laughs) and I was like I think this was one of my favorite scenes to do because it was so different in how I delivered the character and then I was thinking a lot about how to to do that Marissa there is a quote that to and our chat I would like to share with you, and I'm very anxious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I found this BBC article that was titled, What the Myth of Faust Can Teach Us. And the quote I thought was very interesting was that the author said, every notable historical era will have its own Faust. And that struck me, and this was also when Ben and I were going through, you know, the canon of these characters that have spun off of or been inspired by Faustus. And, you know, we, we were talking about not, not just Trump, but all. There are so many leaders and to- tops of their professions who have that power struggle. So I was curious yeah. to see what you thought about that. That's really really interesting and I think what I will say about that is there are people who chase the power that they don't deserve to have and they chase that power unknowingly because they don't actually know what it means to to possess it uh and that can be taken on in in you can see that in everyday life where leaders are given positions of power where they shouldn't uh people it's almost it's almost as if the wrong person is always given the wrong thing like the the the, these people whether it's money they're all it's all it goes to the wrong person right it goes to the ones that are are playing in space instead of like fixing whatever we have here or it goes to the ones that are or i mean just in general like you just some people have and some people don't the ones that have are the ones that like i would not do that with if i had this power if i had this money if i had this talent if i had whatever it is so so yeah, I feel you're, you're watching a character undeservingly suffer, right? Because they got this, they're suffering. They're suffering you feel as deserved, but they are given something that you would do very different things with. And that is seen in almost every, everything because I think that is how our world works. I feel like that's kind of the rule. If that's weird to say, like it almost- Certainly the pattern, like, certainly the pattern. It's a, it's a very easily identifiable uh, identifiable pattern it's its we, own tragic little it's like circle. this is very on brand this is the trend that we're seeing for a lot of yeah, whenever i hear anything you know with, whether it's politics related or or medical or something like yes the, the doctor that doesn't deserve to be the chief of medicine is the chief of medicine the and, and the underdog is is the underdog and it's a it's almost a myth it's always going to be the person that there's always going to be someone who doesn't deserve what they have, terrorizing everybody else. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, like the Wolf of Wall Street. You know, we talked yeah. about we talked about Voldemort. Um, you know, uh, Rosemary yeah. Rosemary's Baby, Walter White in Breaking Bad. Like, uh, you know, it's like Faustian uh, bargain in The Little Mermaid. Really, <laughs> literally, <laughs> like you're watching these characters, and, and what you do notice is like the decrepitness at the end of all yeah. of these things that you're mentioning because they're Such chasing word, yeah. something that they don't they don't deserve and they they don't need and they're obsessed about it it's something that doesn't come easy that's like one of my philosophies in life to avoid being this way yeah. it's very easy to consume you to chase something that is not meant to be for you and very and true powers one and, and those things so if it doesn't come easy right if it doesn't la- that's this is not a lazy way to think <laughs> what do you feel like if it doesn't yeah. fall into place 
if you are forcing a relationship, if you're forcing a job, if you're forcing your, your happiness into something that you know you shouldn't be doing, it never works out for you. And you become your own villain. And that's literally what happens in this play. You know, you chase things. You had all this greatness. It wasn't good enough because it, it didn't fulfill you because you don't actually know what fulfills you. So, I mean, this play, I mean, it's so easy. Yeah, look at, so, I mean, honestly, look at all these people that have achieved greatness. It's like, all right, but was that really what they were supposed to be doing? Did they actually change the world? Did it help anybody in the process? If the answer is no. Then, yeah, like, it's very obvious that the universe, I don't know, I speak of the universe like that. It just works that way. <laughs> like, it just, this is our world. This is how we created it to be this way. People who are not deserving of their positions, who are not deserving of those things, they suffer from that. But this time you display, you don't see the display of suffering, right? You'll never see it on, on social media, on Instagram or anything like that. But this play, right. you right. get to see it. You get to see what it's like to be that. Like think of the crown. I'm, not, I'm sure you guys have watched it on Netflix. Oh no. my. Oh. You watch like how Queen, how, how Queen Elizabeth is portrayed is so like, wow, you almost feel, do I feel sorry for this person? Do I, do I think That's about the thing. It? It's like, do I? That is really the question. No, right? Because at the end of the day, you're like, ah, well, I, either I would have done it better. These are your two thoughts, right? Either I would have done it better or I, I, you know, I wouldn't have even sought after those things because that's not even on my radar, right? So those, those things are really interesting. I definitely take this play with me now for the rest of, probably the rest of my thinking about it, at least for the good yeah. next year. Because How could you not? How could you it was not? like, it was also my first lead. So it was really like profound to dissect this so much and actually get to share the thoughts in my head that I have of this character is really nice. Well, Marissa, Marissa Flores, this was a- are, Yeah, we are all very lucky for having heard this and I think we would all do well to listen to you. <laughs> I really I, I really enjoyed playing this character, as, you know, because I I find him to be just like the, the ugliness un, unveiled and and then everyone gets to sit there and they're like i don't want that like after watching like i don't think i want those kinds of problems i don't think i want those kinds of issues like and and that's something that everyone has to think about i mean like do you want to do do you want to suffer like that or, or do you want to do something different like where's your happiness he he definitely made me think about that stuff marissa thank you so much for lending your time and talent and for taking the time to chat with us today. This truly was so interesting and eye-opening. I feel like we we pulled the curtain back Thank a you. little bit and yeah. uh, really got into some interesting, heady topics. Great topic. Thank you. Very enlightening. If anyone wants a deep dive on this play, they gotta come to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I feel so like, I, was like, I really, I always start off with like, I am not, an expert in any way. <laughs> so just, you sound like one. I mean. <laughs> and for those um, of you who have not listened to The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe, please check it out on Standby for Places. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Marissa.